Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Department of English and Comparative Literature and the American University in Cairo, AUCI, Ferial Ghazoul, welcome you to the 18th Edward Said Memorial Lecture. Edward Said lived in Egypt when he was young and was a frequent visitor to Cairo after he settled in New York City. He was invited to lecture as a distinguished university professor several times at AUC. When he passed away, our department, with the support of the AUC administration, arranged for a series of annual uh, Said Memorial Lectures. The speakers who have delivered the Said Memorial Lecture in the past include David Damrosch, Barbara Harlow, Cornel West, Terry Eagleton, Rockes de Groot, Judith Butler, John Carlos Rowe, Michael Wood, Sari Magdesi, Marina Warner, Lila Abu Lord, Suleiman Jen, Usama Magdesi, Robert Young, Wadiya Saeed, Raja Shahadi, Noam Chomsky. We are honored today to celebrate the life of Edward Said through one of his former students and friend, Timothy Brennan, a distinguished professor of English and comparative literature at, and a, a cultural critic and an activist who has recently published a book on the life of Edward Said entitled Places of Mind, A Life of Edward Said which relates contrapuntally to Said's memoir, Out of Place. Professor Brennan's book on Said has been translated into Turkish, Spanish, Chinese, and Arabic. And Farsi. Okay. Muhammad Asfur translated it into Arabic using the title Edward Said Amakin al Fikr and was published in last year in 2022 in the series Alam al Ma'rifa in Kuwait. Timothy Brennan was educated at the University of Wisconsin Medicine and Columbia University. He had several prestigious university posts in the US and Germany and has been a professor for the last 25 years at the University of Minnesota. He has received several awards, including Samuel Russell Chair in the Humanities and the Palestine Prize for Biography. His books include Borrowed Light, Vico, Hegel, and the Colonies. Wars of Position, the Cultural Politics of Left and Right. At Home in the World, Cosmopolitanism Now. Salman Rushdie and the Third World, Myths of the Nation. Although Professor Brennan is known as a distinguished figure in the field of cultural studies. He has also left his imprint on other fields such as photography and music. He had several exhibits related to labor, war, and empire. He has also published books on Afro-Latin music, and jazz and on Cuban music. Professor Brennan's lecture today is about the challenging genre of life story writing. It's entitled 
on writing a biography of Edward Said, the personal, the impersonal, and back again. Let's. <laughs> Professor Brennan, the floor is yours. It's really, really nice to be here. I've not been to Cairo before. I've seen as much as I could have of it over the last two days and expect to see a lot more. But um, I wanted to begin, obviously, by thanking the organizers, and I realize there's more than one, for giving me the honor of joining earlier speakers in the Edward Said Memorial Lecture Series at the American University in Cairo. I had no idea how eminent a list that was until just now. I mean, needless to say, I would rather have foregone the honor of having, uh, in place of having Edward still with us, and I know uh, that I'm a poor substitute for the man himself, but I would like to think that the issues I'm addressing today share some of his outlooks and sensibilities. The best judge of that, I imagine, uh, would be the host I wish to thank most, Ferial Kazul whom I had the great pleasure of meeting in London in 2004. We had very dear friends in common, chiefly the late Barbara Harlow, who long ago filled my ears with legendary stories of her transformative time teaching in Egypt many years ago, an experience that turned her from a run-of-the-mill deconstructionist into an influential intellectual firebrand. To this day, I cannot think of Alif, a journal of comparative poetics, inseparable from Ferial's career, and a journal I have followed since 1990, and once written for, actually, without thinking of the global range and intellectual force of Ferial herself. Thank you for inviting me. It's not often that a public lecture gets instructions in advance, but in our correspondence over the last few months, Ferial talked about her teaching a research methods course on autobiography, adding that she and her colleagues were all fascinated these days in life writing studies. Why then not, she suggested, talk about my own methods and strategies for writing about such a complex figure as Edward Said? How she asked, did you come to orchestrate all the archives and testimonials you had access to in the book? You chose, for example, a chronological order, but that order could have been thematic. In life writing, she continued, one weeds through thousands of possible choices, and only some make the cut. Otherwise, um, in life writing, one weeds through thousands of possible choices, and only some make the cut. Otherwise, it would be an infinite task. You focused on Saeed's mind, she said, or so says your title. But what exactly does that mean? Were you trying to reveal the unknown Saeed or plumb the depths of the better-known public intellectual? How did the book take this form and not another? I thought about this, and one possible response is, <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, it came to me fully formed. Uh, Edward and I, in many respects, couldn't be more different. Um, it came to me fully formed. We were a marriage of minds in many respects, despite being so different in so many ways. Uh, but I realize that that really won't do for a talk like this. So let me work my way back to these questions after first dwelling on the term life writing itself. The turn of criticism to biography, autobiography, and memoir lately has swept all before it and broken down the walls between media celebrities and professors. As witnessed perhaps by the recent fawning profiles of literary academics like Lauren Berlant and Sian Nai in the pages of The New Yorker. These two images, which roughly reproduce those of The New Yorker itself, give you a sense of the current life of English professors 
who have discovered the interior life of feelings in what I think it is fair to call a post-Edward age. Broadly, of course, life writing refers simply to the genres of personal narrative, autobiography, biography, memoir, diary, autobiographical fiction, and testimonial. Recently, though, it has begun to take over other zones of writing and thinking, into which the personal was never supposed to intrude. History, oral history, ethnography, criticism, cultural theory, architecture, even economics. Telling one's story is never far from narrative. Think of the blending of fact and fiction in the gonzo anthropology of Mick Tausig, or to take another example, Sidya Hartman's fictocriticism, which is sometimes called critical fabulation. Both are essentially the art of inventing the experiences and words of marginalized peoples, most, mostly in her case, that is Sidya Hartman's case, young black women from the turn of the century who left behind no records, and so, the argument goes, needs the sympathetic scholar to fill the historical gap with a good story. Leaving aside the possible apologies for the procedure, and I can imagine some, I would like to think, as I imagine Edward might have, about how this spectacular explosion of the authority of fiction and memoir mirrors the supposed virtues of proximity, haste, and immediacy in capitalist everyday life, where immediacy means the absence of all mediation. That is, no social good establishing the standard against which personal needs are measured. No intermediary between my desire and my message. Only the goal expressed in chirpy phrases like, just do you, let it flow, speak your truth, and so on. There's an obvious pull these days, and it goes beyond the New Yorker pieces I referred to, for scholars to flee the archive, to testify to life as it is, right here, now, in the present, life as it feels, folding the reflections on Wittgenstein, Susan Sontag, and Deleuze into prose snapshots of sex on concrete floors. A spectacular example of this can be found in the best-selling, exorbitantly rewarded books of Maggie Nelson, above all the Argonauts, whose auto theory offers splintered reflections on desire, the veils of language, and the limitations of love, in a mode that relies on the only truth that is by definition indisputable, what is right for me. Nelson's abrupt, fertile, and frighteningly intelligent writing sells theoretical observations. Nelson's abrupt, fertile, and frighteningly intelligent writing sells theoretical observations by disowning them. Learned propositions on cruelty, freedom, and the avant-garde are entombed in the ameliorative frame of feeling. It is not that arguments are not made or judgments rendered, only that they are mitigated, apologized for, one might say, by the worship of subjective experience. Quotations from Nietzsche, anecdotes about Roland Barthes, these are not really ideas, these are not really ideas, claims, or positions, she seems to say, they're only fleeting states of the author's brilliant feminist queer mind, whose close-up portraits fills the frame, practicing criticism at the very moment that she thinks out loud about being stung by a friend's recent insult. At issue in these moves is not simply the increasingly dodgy claim that truth and fiction are not the same. That's the obvious side of the matter but the right for anyone to speak in the interests of anyone else. In its passion to rely on immediate experience, memoir would seem to be an enemy of fiction 
since it shows impatience with whatever is made up, with whatever stands in for something else, which poses the danger of universalizing experience. The goal here is rather to tether it firmly to immediacy, that is, to irreducible particularity. So this turn to memoir and autobiography in the world of criticism is against representation in every sense, against fiction, because it employs the lie of metaphor, the thing said to stand in for the thing meant, but also against representation in the sense of speaking for others. Greeks taking the side of Turks, elite Bengali academics carrying the torch for Bihari presence, peasants, and so on. In truth, though, the two positions merge. The immediacy of memoir and the indirection of fiction converge at the point of subduing all critique. In the London Review of Books recently, I read a reviewer praise a book for being part memoir, part literary criticism, as though it were a novelty. In fact, a lot of literary criticism, criticism takes the form of memoir, sweeping the book prizes in our confessional age. Eventually, scholars get the message, refashioning themselves as journalists or mini autobiographers who demonstrate their bona fides by publishing a piece or two in Esquire or the Atlantic Monthly. This brag of having entered the world of middle-brow journalism shows where the real power lies. And the implication is that the professor who has managed to be seen in that company has gone beyond the profession, rather than that they've abandoned a certain kind of difficult content for work that, whatever its content, which might be very good, gives preference to fiction and autobiography. While writing Edward's biography, I entered these debates, at least in my head, and I saw buried within them the theoretical battles Edward himself waged over telling his own story while trying to speak for others. And I'm speaking as a biographer rather than as a former student when I say that Edward, taken whole, might be considered a non-aesthetic object of beauty. He managed to ride a wave of his own creation, always doing in the moment what he at the same time had earlier planned and currently managed from a hovering place above and outside that moment. I think this role of messenger surprised him as much as it did us and was even a burden to him. I know I'm not alone in feeling that he was, as Mohammed Shaheen has put it, a great and beautiful novel. Those around him knew this, even winked and nodded at one another to express that they understood this about him. If this X factor was not really evident in his early schooling or childhood, it became obvious in his 20s and as he began to face the public. And it came to the fore under the pressures of breaking into the mainstream when his conversational brilliance, and his genius was essentially conversational, took on some of the aura of a Christian conversion story. He would have hated the analogy given his intense secularity, but all those Bible studies classes he grew up taking at school, not unlike his love for the Catholic communist martyrdom of Antonio Gramsci, made him recognize the affiliations between his own inspiring transformation in college and grad school and that of the political saints he had already enshrined in childhood, above all the Egyptian communist doctor and martyr Farid Haddad and his own aunt Nadia doing charitable work in Cairo for the first Palestinian refugees of 1948. A few months ago, I read a manuscript for a British publishing house. This manuscript was drawing on affect theory, the view that feelings prior to and divorced from thinking 
have certain cognitive and ethical advantages over thought itself. This book was making the case that Edwards' overall project, his themes, arguments, theories, all are expressions of his personal inventory. That is, the account he gives of himself as a racially and culturally mixed person in the world. The author distinguished this approach from biography proper, which, according to him, typically sets out to demonstrate how a person's life interacts with or creates the conditions for their accomplishments. The claim here was more extreme than it might appear. He was saying that the substance and force of Edward's criticism itself was that very articulation of his personal inventory. No more, no less. That the very stuff of his message was inextricable from and the same as expressing his personal dimension. I think Edward rejected this. He might have called it bio theory uh, and denied that thought is the body speaking. I mean, we all have our pasts, our bodies, our family ties. In a class-ridden racist society, those inheritances obviously condition how we think and what we're moved to know. But not every African-American lawyer knows the history of the civil rights movement because they were born black. Isn't the point of education to project oneself into other experiences, to learn what one is not, the Midwest Jewish Sinologist or the Catholic woman from Goa who becomes a Milton scholar. Or maybe I only had to believe this when writing a biography of Edward, whose upbringing and tastes and music were very different from mine, but whose sensibility, style, and intellectual politics were at least from my point of view, almost identical. Obviously, Edward's memoir, Out of Place, and his autobiographical pieces for crossover publications like the New York Times Magazine, or Harper's, or Al Aram, foreground his personal dimension. But there were reasons for that. For example, to set the record straight in order to fend off charges from Zionist ill-wishers, or antagonists within the PLO, that as a well-heeled American academic with expensive suits and a continental accent, he was inauthentic. He also, of course, wished to narrate his own Palestinian displacement so that it might stand for the experiences of others of his class and education in the diaspora, to make it understandable as a general plight he went on, importantly, to distinguish his travails from the, to him, very different agonies of Palestinian guest workers in the Middle East, working class immigrants in Detroit, or the many thousands living under constant siege in Gaza. A final reason may have been rhetorical, to grip readers at the level of the personal, which his reasoned arguments and assembling of data couldn't do. My skepticism about the autobiographical turn, which I've been describing here at the beginning, comes in part from a talk Edward gave right here at AUC in 1994 about what biography can and cannot do. There he called into question the whole notion of identity, which is the animating principle of biography identical not only with itself, but identical in a sense with the period in which it existed and flourished. I, I love the kind of roundabout, um, circuitous, deflecting way that he constructed that sentence. Very much like him. Our identities, he seemed to be saying, are conditioned by period and time, most of all. Biography, then, should be intellectual history more than a playground of dramatis personae. Earlier, he added a further caution. My point of departure will be the failure of the attempt to represent the mind as a simple archeological object that is easily recovered by psychological digging. <laughs> 
The key point here that I take from it is not to be simple, but not not to dig. But before assembling the history or digging in his mind, I just let it flow, but not doing me or doing him. The fact is that I benefited from my own procrastination in the actual writing of this book. The call from the literary agent Andrew Wiley asking me to write the biography came out of the blue. It's not every day that you get a call like that from somebody who, to me, was already known because he was Salman Rushdie's agent and I had written about Salman Rushdie years before. So what is this fellow doing calling me? But it did mean, it was very clear in this conversation, that I would have to drop what I was working on at the time, delaying that book by what I thought would be three years. Six years later, I was still at it. Reeling in the glow of Wiley's call, for months I did nothing about the 40-page proposal he asked me to write so that he could shop it around to publishers. When the inevitable follow-up call came asking where it was, I had, to sit, um, I had to sit down and write the proposal in a single outpouring over a week. The basic structure of what I proposed there never changed, and even the original subtitles stayed intact. That is the chapter title. If I had plotted, I would have stalled. I drew instead on a pre-intellectual impulse derived from having internalized Edward's personality and career without knowing it. The moment was what the Germans call nachträglich, a retrospective recognition that the book was in a sense already written. I was obviously helped by having come to know Edward during his pre-breakout ascendancy, that is just after Orientalism appeared, and was published, and just prior to his hitting the stratosphere, about five or six years later. I was able to witness this transition uh, up close. The initial problem when setting out actually to write this thing that the proposal described was pacing. On the one hand, anecdote, color. On the other, the historical and exegetical, tightly bound together. I did not so much try on different approaches to life writing as parse at the level of the phrase what successful biographies actually do. How long, for example, were the exegetical passages? How much technical diction could you throw at your audience? How much dumbing down without sounding silly or patronizing? I closely studied David Macy's The Lives of Michel Foucault, Jan Swafo's Beethoven, Anguish and Triumph, Andrew Hodge's Alan Turing, The Enigma, Howard Island and Michael Jennings' Walter Benjamin, A Critical Life, and my former teacher Edward Mendelssohn's Early Autumn, Late Autumn. There was part of the adventure of learning how to write a biography, which I had not done before. This meant first wading through the Columbia archive of his personal papers, basically hundreds of large and poorly ordered cardboard boxes with manila envelopes stuffed with essay drafts, his own fiction, and correspondence, most of it boring and routine, but necessary to plow through in order to get to the gem or two buried within. And then the problem of how to fill in the gaps when over the span of his career, the technologies changed, and typed or handwritten letters gave way to faxes, emails, or transcribed voice recordings. The most valuable of these were his student transcripts at three different schools, since these were filled with very private and sensitive information about his health, his early psychological profile tests that researchers on Said had never before had access to. Along with the conversations with childhood friends, they helped me trace the disparities between the way he saw himself as a young man and the way others saw him in the same years, which led to my rethinking and significantly changing a number of the themes of the memoir, Out of Place. 
The FBI files were another fascinating archive, easily procured, but heavily redacted, which made them frustrating. The student dossiers were a gold mine for several reasons. Among them, that we finally get to glimpse by way of his application letters, firsthand evidence of the little boy that some of us had seen up to this point only through the heavily filtered account of his memoir, one that clearly had been worked over and importantly altered by the adult Edward, probably unwittingly. As novelistic and as compelling as his memoir Out of Place is, it gives us almost no information about his sisters, about his explosive and intellectually engaged first marriage to Myra Janice, about his traumatic head-on car crash with a motorcyclist in Switzerland, about the true nature of his relationship with his music teacher, Ignaz Tigerman, about the initiatives he took from his wife and children, very important, about his important friendships with the right-wing Lebanese diplomat and close friends of the family, Charles Malik, the fiery Syrian Marxist, Sadiq al-Azm, and other matters. It also, this memoir, Said's memoir, also gives us a troubled, very dark portrait of his father that the surviving documents and the contemporaneous witnesses simply do not bear out. And of course, the memoir treats his entire undergrad years in a few paragraphs and skips grad school and the rest of his life, certainly the most important part of it. Wiley, from the very start, had proposed to me to write an intellectual biography, not a biography. It was clear from the beginning that you can't tell the story of a man's ideas without telling us something about the man, someone as captivating as Edward. So it was always a tightrope walk, deciding when and where to assert dramatic vignettes, character sketches, and so on, and how much to stick to the narrative arc based on the drama of his ideas. In the end, I calculated this way. Nothing mattered more to Edward himself than the mission of the intellectual in the pundit-ridden corporate world of Anglo-America. What it means to be an intellectual is therefore the most important thing to capture in his life story. If you don't do that, you're betraying him, in my opinion. Being a literary critic and a theorist of continental philosophy was no early life detail that he happily outgrew. It's what formed him politically and made his public interventions effective and memorable. One of my interviewers thought my biography a kind of biopic. Effective biopics, he said, need a prior theory, even as they let their subject evolve freely in the course of the narrative. Great analogy, I thought. I'd written a lot about Edward before taking on the biography, publishing about 13 essays or so, some of it while he was still alive. So I had a swarm of leitmotifs buzzing in my head, plain speaking and the conversational over writing. That was one thing. Sacrificing his love of the aesthetic and the philosophically dense in the name of reaching the public. That was another theme. Rejecting the modernist notion of an abrupt revolutionary break in favor of the idea of tradition and the influences we all actively choose, the ones that bind us to the past. We are all contradictory, but his contradictions stood out. The well-rewarded rebel, the thoroughly American Arab, and so on. All of this had to be distilled into the one thing the book had to be about, that his greatest achievement was not changing the discussion around Palestine, but bringing the humanities to the center of public life, raising its discourse above the gee whiz banalities of American pragmatism. Also, I think this is accompanying it, his second great accomplishment, that apart from what we know about his moving the university curriculum towards non-Western histories and heroes, or paving the way for more scholars and students from India, Africa, and the Middle East, he also created a counter-tradition. He stared down an obscure and pretentious 
post-structuralist theory by giving scholars a new rhetorical palette and a different lineage of sources. For academics, I think maybe that was even more important. My editor at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, Eileen Smith, was difficult. And the first version of the manuscript, which I rewrote from beginning to end three times, was half again as long as the current one. Some resentment accompanied my digesting of her editorial demands. I feared for years that she was cramping my style and felt sure that the earlier versions were much better. They certainly contained a lot more information uh, and allowed me more in-depth readings and theorizing. But now I'm not so sure. I look back on it and I really, really thank her difficulty. What I learned is that editors at commercial presses, at least Eileen, they don't give you very much to go on. She tells you in general terms what has worked and what hasn't, but it's nothing like line editing. Long passages would be crossed out and she'd simply say, condense, or you're getting lost in the weeds. Others with a long vertical line drawn in the margin alongside the word perfect. After about a year and a half of this, with much extrapolation on my part, I could finally tell the one prose from the other. And at that point, I was able to revise the entire book in a few months, giving it its present shape. One way to put it is that I discovered parataxis. Obviously, as a literary critic, I, I knew what this word parataxis meant, but I did not really understand it until writing the biography. Editorial ruthlessness forced me to learn how to imply content rather than spell it out. Dispense with adjectives. Avoid adverbs. It is surprising how much can be conveyed fleetingly, a sentence or phrase, if it says exactly what you mean without decoration. It can stand for entire chapters. And if the pacing remains true to that concept, the reader comes to expect that major material will be conveyed that way throughout, in passing, as it were, with barely a touch of the hand. One example, maybe not the best, can be found in the passage that opens chapter 12. My watch, Said once wrote about his childhood, guarded my life like a sentinel. Now a grown man, he had to live with the consequences. 9 p.m. still represents lateness. I won't read the rest of it because it's up there on the screen, but uh, what I'm trying to get across here is that the information that's found in three different places in this paragraph came from entirely different sources at entirely different uh, times during the process of writing it. So the way the entire manuscript was done, basically, was to um, take something that would have maybe been spun differently in a different context and juxtapose it with things that were found uh, that seemed to relate, but that needed also, from my part, a verbal splice that would create the illusion of causality and the illusion of the flow of narrative. So um, I, I guess this is an example of what I mean by, by parataxis. So some of this information comes from my conversations with uh, Mariam, uh, his widow. Uh, some of it comes from things that were culled from his letters uh, in a very different context than the one I'm trying to strike here at the beginning of this chapter. Uh, and some of it was uh, material that was important for me to express in this way because of earlier themes I had established about the, the discipline that he enforced on himself as a child, not allowing himself to play, not allowing himself to ever relax around his friends. This uh, contrast or tension between the fact that he actually wasted a lot of time uh, was the right kind of contrast that I needed at this point in the book to 
uh, expand upon, but also to deviate from some of what I had established early in the book. So this is um, what I mean. Uh, parataxis was a great revelation for me, and I didn't understand it until now. Edward's own examples were also, of course, a part of what I was thinking of, that is, the examples that I'd learned from reading his material. Um, well, which examples? Well, his conversational directness, his hatred of being coy, um, combined with what he, he often called his unbuttoned mode of proceeding, was also combined with the art of avoidance, of strategic indirection, in which it was as important to know what to leave unmentioned as what explicitly to say. And I think that accompanied with the notion of parataxis, this is what I would stress, is that I, I understood that it was very important for me not to say certain things, in part to keep faith with it being an intellectual biography, rather than, let's say, the biography that was published in the same year as mine, uh, the biography of Philip Roth, which is an 800-page uh, sprawling tell-all, you know, uh, mostly going from one sexual escapade to another. It was, by the way, the editor who insisted that this biography and every biography must be strictly chronological. So that wasn't a choice on my part. That wasn't up for discussion. For otherwise, it is a study, not a biography, and destroys the invitation to readers to project into a life and to try it on as their own. One of the major reasons that one reads biographies in the first place. It prevents the reader from attempting to pinpoint exactly when the protagonist moved from obscurity to fame or from potential to realization. There are other reasons it must be chronological. Only in that frame does one realize what the subject knew when or what he or she only discovered later. Only then can one appreciate what different sorts of threads were being pulled at the same time, what bewildering combinations of events, encounters, and ideas were taking place simultaneously, how chance meets choice. Bildung is a process, and a thematic structure presents only the finished material, not the process itself. Any mass of details, however, needs a hook to hang on. The word mind in my title was meant to do that kind of work. Place connotes what is anchored and material, not prone to vagaries. And it is also telegraphic, referring to Edward's lifelong fascination with geography. That is to land understood as immovable and non-negotiable territory, but also to this particular mind, which was divided, clouded, agonized, and ingenious. That meant that his personality did, of course, enter his ideas, even in the writing that was not autobiographical. Autodidacticism was for him more than spurning specious credentials. It was an improvisatory, unsanctioned knowledge that arose from reading without particular plan or use. His mind, in that sense, knew more than one place. It roved. Edward was also his own favorite subject. He fascinated himself. He spent a lifetime investigating himself with a kind of wonder as an alien object whom he struggled to understand and whom he did not particularly like. At the same time, he was repelled, re repelled by the dramatization of self-dramatization of uh, authors like V.S. Naipaul, Susan Sontag, George Steiner, and Cynthia Ozick. Although for some reason, not the egomaniacal Philip Roth who he was always compelled by, who he corresponded with, but uh, finally did not become like. He did not emulate. Who he did emulate were intellectuals like Gramsci and Adorno, who precisely sacrificed their egos in pursuit of the Marxist universal. <laughs> 
His mind was devoted to the problem of place because he had no place of his own and eventually came to see the absence of place as the intellectual's true calling. More than the essay, because essays are fragmentary, unfinished, an attempt rather than a conclusive synthesis, Edward thrived in conversation. So one would be tempted to say that his best genre was the essay because it hit on those themes of the inconclusive, the unresolved, which he frequently did. But if tens of thousands of his readers had never seen him perform on the lecture circuit or as a subject of a documentary film or in one-on-one -on -one television interviews, we would not know him in the same way. He would not be nearly as important as he is. I think in this sense, and only in this sense, would I say that personality, which I was apparently diminishing or downgrading in the opening part of my talk, was, uh, was important to him. But, but strategically, rather than, as I say, uh, doing you. I'm saying that I had many conversations with him at formative times of my life. And because I was nobody, and because he treated his advisees like younger brothers with an almost theatrical informality, I mean, for, for example, he'd call me Timmy Baby uh, and plop himself down on the couch in his office to discuss a dissertation chapter. That would be a typical gesture. He would tell me things in this mode or in this mood in offhanded moments that revealed volumes about how he thought, what he really meant, and what mattered most to him. I could never have written a biography if I hadn't heard them. He thought, for example, of the well-known post-colonial critic, kind of a giant within the field, Homi Baba. He thought him a player, for instance, but he would never say that publicly. He looked with incredulity at what he took to be Gayatri Spivak's dubious women's work in Indian villages, and flatly said that she did not know how to write. But he chided colleagues for criticizing her in print and was instrumental in getting her hired at Columbia. Walking across campus with me, he once outrageously complained with a glint in his eye of the incompetence of the Palestinian militants. The Israelis had assassinated so many of our leaders. How could it be that we could not pull off even one assassination ourselves? A sentiment, needless to say, would never have uttered in public. So one puts together this vast, hidden cache of confessions, jibes, sub rosa opinions, and anecdotes, all delivered, and this is important, in a boyish manner with a fierce authority that was my company for five or six formative years in which I more or less lived on Columbia's campus. You then gauge that against the themes of his seminars or the figures and writings he was having us read in classrooms that were more like laboratories in which his books were conceived before they were written. And seeing them that way, in tandem, with an intimate knowledge of the person, you begin to understand things that were not easily accessible in the carefully crafted public persona or to careful researchers poring over a trove of documents at a later date. It might be a little interesting for any of you who are contemplating writing a book like this if I just relate what it was like to gather firsthand information for research. First, apart from the obvious labors of tracking people down all over the world, there is also the rush to finish these interviews before the subjects died, since Edward was part of a vanishing generation. About eight people who supplied information for the book did not live long enough to read it. It's strange, but an unexpected obstacle arose when I noticed that a lot of the interviewees were more interested in talking about themselves than Edward. It took some subtle persuasion to get them to stay on track there's also the whole issue of unreliability, people misremembering, people who would prefer to remember things one way rather than another, and therefore the need for triangulation. Anyone writing a book like this will be familiar with interviewees denying that they had said what you have them on tape saying. It takes a lot of time. Some interviewees surprised, some interviewees surprised me by refusing to be interviewed. The well-known Lebanese novelist, Elias Khoury, for example, 
who was so close to Edward in life and whose career Edward advanced so tirelessly never seemed to have the time. Vanessa Redgrave, a dear friend of his, could not spare a half hour to talk because, as she put it to me on the phone, she was writing her memoirs. How different this was from other famous people who were humble, by contrast, and quick to share confidences. The novelist and art critic John Berger, for example, and Daniel Berenboim. I flew to New York for the sole purpose of interviewing Berenboim, meeting him in the lobby of a midtown Manhattan hotel. He was there to conduct the complete symphonies of Bruckner at Carnegie Hall. And as I came upon him, he was chatting in Spanish with family friends from Argentina, where he's originally from. When he sat down with me, he plied me with wine for an hour and a half and spoke unguardedly about his love for Edward and the fact that Edward knew everything, in his words, about classical music, more than any of the professional musicians with whom he has collaborated. Some were surprised that the biography I wrote seemed so comparatively dispassionate, as though written in another's voice. I'm taken, I guess, from time to time in certain circles as being rather polemical. So this was surprising. This was deliberate. I was struck by those who implied that only they knew the real Edward. There were some interviewers who were that way, that only they knew the real Edward. Forgetting that Edward had the habit of confiding in you with information that he confided, quote unquote, to a dozen others as well. The Edward you knew was the one he let you see, reserving different selves for others. This is true even for lovers and childhood friends, some of whom have written books about him. My approach then was not to pretend, as they did, that the Edward I knew personally for so long was the only one, but rather to move between the different versions in search of a plausible composite. Whether I succeeded or not, I don't know, but I tried to follow his own emphases over the stretch of his writings and speaking, rather than to superimpose an argument on detractable materials. This allowed me to organize it. It organized itself because I was following his leads. Edward, in my view, was very deliberate about how he wanted his career to look. He plotted it out very consciously in Cairo. Champagne Urbana and in Beirut, right down to where he planned to publish and when, and on what themes, and in what order. His beginning thought appear in the book called Beginnings. The late statement on fending off cynicism is called On Late Style. These combined materials, in my view, if you dwell on them and really know the oeuvre, guide one through the intellectual life which continually returns to the main ideas, ones he restated and reformulated constantly from new angles. I tried to let the archive lead. It became, it became clear to me early, as I sat down with those who knew him well or had expertise in areas I did not, that my own take on Edward had to give, that I had to concede aspects of him that I had suppressed before, or not noticed. People who knew him at times of his life when I was not there simply had to be acquiesced to, deferred to. All the same, I had access to materials no one else had, and no one before went through the entire record. So implicitly, yes, even though I do not highlight the intervention, I knew that I was correcting errors. For example, his surprising love of poetry, even though he's thought of as being a student of the novel, or the degree to which as a student he was immersed in philosophy, but repudiated that interest later when he claimed quite inaccurately that he was not able to think in abstractions. I think the influence of his mentor Harry Levin on him had been extremely underrepresented. And I think that people didn't really understand that Orientalism was in favor of philology, not opposed to it. That 
although it would be an overstatement to say that it was not about the Middle East and not about representations of the Arab, that its primary focus was really on the problem of representation itself and how uh, the contemporary media is the arena of action for any public intellectual who has political commitments. I explicitly rejected autobiography in my writing of the biography. I do intrude into the narrative, but only in the introduction. People needed to know my personal relationship with them, but I did not want them to keep popping up as a distraction in the body of the biography itself. You'll notice that a lot of the narrative flow of the book is composed of fragments drawn from the testimony of others that I try to weave together so that the seams do not show. So if you turn to the notes, for example, you'll see a running list of people that I've interviewed and at times quote, and that is what actually accounts for the content of the narrative that I'm, I'm uh, creating. Uh, it's, not, it's not me. Um, in that sense, I feel like the story, such as it is in the book, is a collective one. I'm the one making choices, true. I'm the one who's fact-checking, turning it into a manageable and coherent style, but the information, and more importantly, the perspective is collective. As for how I made choices in creating the rich fabric of the book, as Ariel kindly said in her, one of her notes to me, many of the choices were made for me. Certain discoveries happened upon by chance, so altered my perception that they structured the narrative. For example, in a world obsessed with the authority of authors, understood here as novelists, it mattered hugely that Edward himself, while trying to change minds and reorient agendas, set out seriously to write fiction. His attempts at fiction are important, not only because of what they reveal about the novelistic properties of his criticism and the intimacy of his relationship to writing, but because he fought throughout his career against the common prejudice that poets and authors were primary, whereas critics were mere commentators. He resolutely rejected this view, which was one of the reasons he did not, in the end, finish the novels, and spent his life arguing that the greater creative and social impact lay with public intellectuals, not authors of fiction. I think the drama of this conflict between writer and critic, to take the name of a very famous essay by Georg Lukács, the Marxist Hungarian intellectual that he frequently had resort to, this, this, the drama of this conflict between writer and critic embodied in this highly conflicted personality is one of the most, seri the most surprising aspects of his life. He managed to indulge his fictional talents in writing the memoir, thereby squaring the circle. But he returned again and again to the idea that it was the intellectual, not the author, who spent their lives knowing the case, assessing the sinews of the whole social fabric and providing alternatives. Authors reflect life. He wanted to change it. And it angered him that whereas hundreds of public forums are staged for novelists in American culture and all kinds of money lavished on them, intellectual, intellectuals are more or less ignored pilloried or mocked. As I sifted in the face of mounting evidence, a pattern of its own emerged in which seemingly unrelated events foregrounded behavioral patterns, standing out willy-nilly. This allowed me to explain at first only to myself why he did what he did in the way that he did. Take the dissonance between his academic success and his Palestinian advocacy. Did, advocacy, did his advocacy bring Palestinians closer to a state of their own? How was his arguable failure in this respect also a kind of success? Or could one could content oneself with the fact that his triumph was at least to make the Palestinian cause a contentiously central fact of policy debate but the more complete fact, I think, was persuasively to show that literary concepts like narrative, the image, and representation had political consequences. There were others, but he was the best at persuading a left public 
that culture, not just economics, was a key element in political power, while reviving the image of the intellectual as creator of agendas, guardian of the historical record, and theoretician of the possible. Let me give another example of how disparate connections organize the narrative. Edwards set out early in his career to write about Jonathan Swift. That's just a fact, not interesting in itself. And we know that his great fascination with Giambattista Vico was always wed in his mind to the Arab figure who preceded Vico and anticipated many of his findings, the medieval historian and theorist of the civic role of letters, Ibn Khaldun. So when I discovered that Edwards' undergraduate essays on Plato, Dante, and Milton are obsessed with literature and politics, and that he was in love with their unashamed didacticism, suddenly the significance of Swift and Ibn Khaldun leapt out. Literary figures of a different type, holders of government posts, working as advisors at court, diplomats. He emulated them for teaching him to be hortatory. But we've been talking about what I included. What about what I did not? Dozens of anecdotes, letters, quotations, events. Tom Mitchell saying that he played piano like he played squash as a competitive sport. He liked to be good at things. Or Christopher Hitchens, that he loved mocking mangled English on menus or putting on a thick Indian accent. Or his schizophrenic modes of engagement, his old lady style of argument, where at a party, say, or in a friend's apartment, he'd be bickering with someone loudly, really going at it, flaying them verbally, but then moments later, calm as though nothing had happened. That old lady style of argument is not my phrase, by the way. It's, it's uh, Tom Mitchell's. Um, I was tempted to explore Noam Chomsky's comment in my interview with him that, quote, we lived in different circles. Ed was part of the intellectual establishment. I have never been a part of it and want nothing to do with it, end quote. Or his wife Mariam's confession that Edward could never be alone. On a trip, he would call her five times a day. Or Edward's love of bullfighting, much more could have been said about that. Partly revealed, I suppose, in his essay, How Not to Get Gored, but it really went much deeper than that. Deep enough for him to scare his young daughter, Najla, by pretending that an appendectomy scar was a result of a bull getting the better of him in the ring. Or his weakness for the sexy couples dance competition television show, Dance Fever, which he'd watch on Saturday afternoons. One morning in San Francisco with his kids, he woke up suddenly and blurted out that he wanted to ride a cable car and eat oysters. On the cable ride, he was giddy, like a teenager, although the hapless kids who went along for the ride were, of course, right that no one sells oysters at 8 a.m. More could have been said about his love for American popular attractions, blurting out one night at home that, he, that we here, our family, never have franks and beans. So he would run to the store for the baked beans and hot dogs, and that was the family's dinner that night. If I had had unlimited space, I would certainly have spent more time on his most revealing correspondence, the long letters to Chomsky, to his friend and political activist, Samuel Bana, to his close friends and collaborators, the Syrian Marxist Sadiq al-Azam, to Lionel Trilling, Harry Levin, Robert Alter, Nadine Gordimer, and Fred Dupie. They show Edward in his element, above all, his inimitable brand of humor. But every narrative has its own rhythm. As my editor put it, every manuscript finds its own length. Violate that, and you've lost the reader. I learned a lot about Edward writing this biography, but even more about writing, that some of its power lies in what you do not say. Thank you. OK. Uh, Cornell West gave a talk here once, uh, I mean, uh, I think in the New Campus, actually. And he talked about Edward Said, is that Edward Said always focused on dry classical English literature, not pop culture. Uh, from your reading of the, the Edward Said, we don't know. Did he have a different opinion about pop culture, uh, jazz, uh, 
<laughs> did you have any opinions about science fiction, anything in Orientalism? Is this, is this Sonia? Um, yeah. As once I invited, I was teaching at Stony Brook at the time, and I invited him to come give a talk to a seminar of mine, and he, one of his, one of his initial comments, kind of like launching into the comments that he really was there to make, was that he didn't care at all for popular culture. And I caught him up short and said, no, you're wrong, and it went boom, boom, boom. So the fact is he loved schlocky novels, I mean, particularly, um, uh, Ludlum, I forget it, Robert Ludlum, I think his name is, right? So he, he read those. When it was time to see a movie, he just hated going to art house movies. He wanted to see things like, um, what is it? Uh, you know, the, 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 what, what is that? It, it, sorry? No, it's, you know, I can't, it's funny, I can't think of it. You know, the, the, the Bruce Willis film and the high rise, and what is that called? Thank you. Die Hard. So th this would be, the, or, or Clint Eastwood films. These are the things that he really loved. And now, I've, like I've re revealed here, because I didn't know it before writing the biography, that he'd watch these schlocky shows on Saturday afternoons. Why doesn't he talk about them in his books? Well, I think I've said, established, that he was cultivating a persona, in part. Um, I think that's part of it. But I think he arrived in the United States in the 1950s, uh, at the height of the McCarthy era and simply developed a very healthy detestation of features of American popular culture that then passed as the norm, right? So I think he's got uh, in his memoir uh, a, a really memorable set of phrases about, you know, gum-chewing Bobby Soxers, you know, uh, in saddle shoes, you know, at the soda fountain, you know, this kind of image. Uh, he hated it. He hated it. But he also hated the, what does he call it, the, uh, the lobotomized cheerleading of the press and many of the people gullibly enraptured by these leaderships. So I think it was important for him to express the very real hatred he had for elements of American popular culture but also hard for him to concede that despite this very continental Europeanized uh, dress and uh, accent, that he was internalizing American culture very, very deeply. The last thing I will say, and, 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 and you know, in a positive way, that he, he, he loved it, and I think I strike that note here at the end, his kids were constantly um, pushing him in that direction. So. You know, for example, I think uh, I have in the biography one point where Najla tells him, uh, teaches him the phrase lipstick lesbian. And once he understood what that was, he worked it into every conversation, like for the next uh, couple of weeks to show he's, he was, you know, with it. The last thing I'll say is that there was, of course, his writing about popular culture from the Arab world, right? So he, he did write about... Um, um Khultum, right? And uh, about uh, the belly dancer, what's her name now? Thank you, yeah, thank you, yeah. So, so that, and then, and then also, let's not forget the wonderful um, comic book series, not comic book, it's kind of a graphic novel, uh, not novel either, graphic presentation of the life of the Palestinians in the occupied territories, uh, put out by the uh, Maltese author, whose name I can't remember right now, but he wrote a whole, yeah, I forget his name, but anyway, he. So, he, so there's record in his writing of having actually uh, uh, cared about popular culture and diagnosed it, yeah. Um, I'm wondering how different would your experience of writing this biography be had Said not written uh, his own memoir? Is the existence of this memoir more useful in the process of your writing of this biography? Is it more challenging? How did it affect your writing? I think there's two kinds of answer there. One would be that probably the biography that I would have written under those conditions would have been more of a blockbuster because many people wouldn't have known these dimensions of his life and I would have been the first one to be able to tell people about it. But the other side of it, and I think this is the more important answer, is that uh, that's a counterfactual, right? Uh, and the fact is that he, he needed 
for the shape of his career and for communicating to people in a different genre, in a different mode than these theoretical works that he was also reading. To, to talk about that side of his life. As I say in my paper here today, that this was something that um, he very uh, consciously undertook in part to express himself in writing in a way that was truth-seeking instead of fictional, okay? For the reasons I gave, which are very different. This, I hope that contrast is clear in what I presented here today. Very different from the turn towards the autobiographical and the memoiristic and it's, it's a distrust of fiction that's now kind of taken hold and taken shape in so many different disciplines, right? It's just a very different. But the final thing I'll say about this is that he reveals things about his conflicted character in the very inaccuracies of the memoir or in what he suppressed in the memoir. And that is itself revealing of his character. So the contrast between what I found and what was in the memoir in that degree kind of is more of a revelation than it would have been if I were telling the story for the first time. Um, you mentioned uh, that Edward Said spoke about uh, people like Gayatri Spivak and um, Homi Baba who we think of as like the giants of, of intellect, modern intellectual that uh, kind of shaped how we think of the third world and the other and all of that. And then what you said was more like relatable. It was like co-workers talking about each other or talking. So I, I, I just want you to elaborate on the phrases that he used to describe them. Like you said, he thinks Homi Baba is a player. So what does that mean? Why would he say that? And he, oh, his opinion of, of Gayatri Spivak's work as well. Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, there were reasons why I didn't include this in the biography because of the kind of response that you're showing right now. It would be, it'd take too much time to really explain why he did that and all that went into that. The uh, biography that I wrote, as I said, was being governed, or the process of my writing it was being governed by a very, very strict editor who I praised to the sky because she was so strict. But to really get at that, I would have needed to spend more time than the general reader would have wanted me to, okay? So is it the cattiness of people in the profession? Yeah, that's, that's partly there, but it's playful cattiness. And after all, Edward came first, right? And so he's looking at them as being people who have sort of entered the field after Edward's own breaking down the walls. But I think it's more than that. It's, it's that the theoretical commitments, which might not matter to the general reader. I'm not sure it would matter to many people in this room, but those lineages that I said before, those chosen traditions, were extremely different between, you know, uh, on the one hand, uh, Baba and Spivak, and on the other, Edward. So Edward clearly is somebody who's much more influenced by Marxist thinkers. He's coming out of a 1960s and 70s uh, national liberation mentality and, and feel. He wants to keep that alive and to some extent revive it during the age of Reaganism, which is when he's rising to prominence. Whereas Baba and Spivak are, from Edward's point of view, sort of gullible followers of the worst dimensions of French theory. In both cases, I think it's mostly Derrida, right? And that isn't just like, well, you know, you have your heroes and I have mine, you know, tit for tat, you say tomato, I say tomato. I think it's saying, he's saying that there are deep and important consequences from the fact that one has chosen to gullibly follow a Derridian sensibility. First of all, it expresses itself in how they wrote. It was difficult for either one of them to actually write whole books. Uh, Gayatri did manage to do so a couple of times, but Baba never did, right? And so there's the denseness, the obscurity, the pretentiousness of the prose. That's part of it, right? The, the, the evident performance of indifference towards the public and actually having them understand, bringing them along at a time when so much needs to be explained, right? So there's, there's that antagonism. Um, it's also how 
rewarded they were for having done, in his opinion, so little, right? So all of that, I think it's, I could go on in this vein, but I think he would never, when it came down to it, when it really mattered, he defended them. You know, there are lots of people that were writing him who could suss out what he really felt and said, you know, kind of like asking for his blessing to write some expose article to show the emptiness of this kind of thinking. He said, no, don't do that. They're on the same side as us, you know? So I think, and that's the key thing, right? When it comes down to it, that's his commitment. So what he says to me at that time, maybe he also knows who I am, you know, by that point and where my sensibilities lie. And uh, he knows that he can say that to me. I'm not going to go tell people, that's one thing. But the other thing is that I'm going to understand it and probably, you know, appreciate it in a certain way. I, I hope that answers it. There's probably more to say. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, you emphasized uh, how much Edward Said constructed his own persona. Do you think it's uh, the task of a biographer for of someone like that, and in your case, of Edward Said, to deconstruct what he constructed, to try and get inside him in some way? Yeah, I guess that relates to the psychological digging that he was counseling us not to do at the beginning. Or, or actually, he says too much uh, psychological digging. It, it's difficult not to do psychological digging when it comes to Edward, simply because he was you know, in, in therapy, intense therapy for most of his life. That's part of what's going on. But partly because insofar as he alludes to this part of his personality and his thinking, he is conflicted about himself, that he is agonized thinking about himself. He, the whole point of this memoir that he wrote was to show that he was not quite right meaning that he was uh, in the dark about who he really was and was never satisfied with anything that he had done um, and that he was constantly uh, driven by the furies, as it were, to write more, produce more, say more, but without ever really feeling like he had put his finger on his own deep-seated anxieties and unhappiness. And I think that there's something there, that there, there is an unhappiness at his core. You ask me whether I think it's the biographer's job to contradict or somehow correct uh, his own uh, representation of himself in print, and I'd say that, I guess I would answer simply yes, and I think that I did, or, or tried to do so. In, in key respects, I think there's, there's things that I'm arguing that motivated him, which he never directly commented on, or if he did, never elaborated on. And so the image I give of him, I think in my own point of view, and you'll judge whether you think the same, was quite different from the way that he presented himself when he sat down formally to do so in writing. Yeah. Maybe, okay. Hello. Uh, sorry, I came in a bit late because of the traffic and stuff, but I mean, um, from what I understood, I hope I understood correctly, that you're writing a biography on Edward Said, right? No, I've already written it. It's, uh, oh, I mean, that, that you wrote one. Yeah. So my question is to you. I mean, um, in other words, are you revisiting parts of your own self or restructuring parts of your own self through that biography? Or what's the... What was the inspiration or, or the initial motive, if you like? I mean, what does it, what, how does it relate to you personally? Okay, Thank you. that's a very fair question. Um, um, I didn't want me to be a big part of this thing. I, of course, fell back on what I know about him and uh, our long friendship, our many conversations, our writing to one another. I mean, like right before he died, he called me up and said, uh, Timmy, my boy, I'd really like you to do something for me, you know, this kind of thing. And that something was, in this case, writing a response to Christopher Hitchens' unconscionable attack on him 
during the, I think it was the 25th anniversary of the publishing of Orientalism and a long screed was written by Hitchens, his former close friend in the Atlantic Monthly, right? But I did not think that I wanted to explore anything about me in here. I wanted it to be a collective project. So I really did discover a lot of things about Said's character and about individual experiences that he had by talking to other people. And I realized that none of us possess him. I mean, that he's bigger than this. And he's also somebody who is, always was, I should say, cagey, okay? But he's very, very, um, he was very careful about what he would say around whomever it was. And so, you know, you can't, no one person is going to get the whole Edward. And yet, here's the job of the biographer. Here's a guy who is huge within literary theory. Here's a guy who transformed, in many ways, the face of the university, both in terms of its demographics and in terms of what became acceptable for people to read. I mean, just to take one small example, he, he made it okay for people to be reading Marxist intellectuals in their seminars. Now it's everywhere. You know, Gramsci, Adorno, Benjamin. I mean, these are the people that I grew up reading before I met Edward, honestly, but it wasn't at all the common thing. So I, I would say that he is somebody who is difficult to pin down but I did not want to be the person who thrust forward my view of who he was. I thought it was important for me to, to, to be humbler about that. He was a world intellectual for so long and so many people knew dimensions of him. He had to be explained to people in literary theory. He had to be explained to people in the Palestinian movements. He had to be explained to people who are just readers in the general public who were kind of interested and fascinated with an intellectual you know, who crossed over right, who wasn't just a professor, right? So, you know, militants in the cause, all these different people. And so there's a lot of good writing that was out there, right, that addressed one side or the other. But who could bring it all together, including his work on music, for example, and really kind of show it as cohering? That's what I, I, that's what I tried to do, okay? So, um, yeah, I'm not sure that answers your question, but... Yeah, that's what I tried. Um, my question is uh, less about the life and more about the writing. And I was wondering, um, you mentioned um, in some detail the process of, you know, your writing, the sources that you used, um, the, the, the research that, of course, went into writing the biography. Um, but I was wondering, and I haven't read the book yet, but based on the last slide, chapter 12, where you explain to us the parataxis, and I was thinking how much, um, how much of Edward Said's voice, direct voice, is there in the biography, and whether the structure, I was wondering again, you know, this is parataxis, because we have Edward Said, and then his wife, and then a, a comment. But is this hypotaxis to what you are saying? I was just thinking about the structure, basically. Thank you. Yeah, to me, to me uh, hypotaxis, uh, which would be, a, a, of course, a, a near antonym to parataxis, is the use of uh, coordinating conjunctions in a series. Okay? So if you speak more figuratively about hypotaxis, as I was speaking figuratively about parataxis, it would be spelling out every causal connection between every event that you narrate in the book. And to me, this would both be verbose, uh, and it would also delimit the possibilities and potentials of what's being communicated. Partly it's also the fact that I'm not sure what those connections are. I don't want to preclude other people's filling in the content because they understand something at that moment, given their training or what they knew about Edward or 
what they knew Edward personally. I don't want to preclude that. So, no, I, I do not think that there's a hypotactical element to my book, except insofar as the chronology is the illusion of continuity. And so it, it must be felt by readers that this just naturally happened this way. It just flowed this way, you know, the first this, then this, then this. It just, but it's, <laughs> that's not, it's painfully evident to somebody writing something like this, that's not the case. So, you know, one could, there's many invitations to be dishonest. Oh, look, don't say that because it might make him look bad or uh, bring this in and make more of it than was really true about it because, you know, you want to puff up his image. There's all kinds of invitations to do that. But it's really important not to do that. Um, and one tries not to do that, right? Does Edward's style of thinking and personality come across in the book? I hope so. I mean, but partly one kind of information that I had recourse to that attempted to establish that are these informal moments when he's writing somebody or when he's giving a phone call, making a phone call to somebody and he's overheard and the conversation exists to put that in, right? I think there's one, one example of that in the biography. I don't know if you've read it or not, but um, there's a phone message he leaves with, uh, with uh, uh, on, on the phone of his uh, good friend Stein, right? The, the great author in her own right, um, who, um, in, in, in which he's playing the part of a hurt friend who's nothing more than a lackey of her, right? So he, he, he plays this thing like, hi, this is Edward Said here. You know, I, uh, I know I don't matter very much to you, but uh, if you can spare a minute, could you, you know, so this, this kind of over the top way of, uh, in a faux manner, an intentionally faux manner, showing his own obeisance or subservience would be classic Edward, right? Or the way that he talked about himself as just a poor black man, you know, this kind of thing. So there's a lot of the actual language that he used in those offhanded moments that I hope show that side of his character. But again, there's so many limitations on what one can do in a situation like this. You're not given a carte blanche. The injunction was very clear from the editor, you know, don't overload this book with quotations. I really, really wish that I could have provided long extracts from his letters. They're absolutely fascinating. Of course, most of them are just business letters, but the ones where he is really getting into a thought or an idea with somebody, it is really, really fascinating. And, you know, in this kind of book, it's just, just a little touch. You know, all I could do is just sort of give a little hint of it and bite my tongue and, 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 and move on and hope that the narrative flowed. But, so there's a lot of those frustrations in writing a book like this. Well, I'll just say that honestly, right now, Mariam and I are talking about um, putting together a volume of his unpublished essays. There's quite a lot of them. Really important ones, too. Um, and this would include long extracts from his letters, um, and it would include photos from the Said family collection that have not been seen before. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're, we're talking about that. So I think it'd be great for people who are interested in following Said's work to, to see that because there's lots of sides of him that are revealed there that are not there in the published writing. Yeah. Uh, well, you just mentioned one thing that you would have included uh, if your editor hadn't forced you to cut them out. What I wanted to ask is, given the constraints that were imposed on you, if you didn't have those constraints, what kind of things or what things might you have included uh, in a biography of Edward Said? Well, I did kind of address that a little bit uh, towards the end of my talk. Um, yeah, th there's a, to take another example, there's an essay that he wrote that was published only in Arabic uh, he wrote it in English, 
but he he published it only in Arabic in the uh, I think it's yeah I don't know how to pronounce it Mawakif 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 right Adonis is uh, the person that he was dealing with there who was the editor who had asked him to write this piece and he wrote this piece but it's it's a very um, it's 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 a it's a psychobiography of the Arab soul, according to him. That's a quotation. Okay, it's a psychobiography of the Arab soul. I think that that needs to be dwelled on. I mean, I've written a long essay on it, and I presented it at the Freud Museum in London. So to me, there's so much to say about what he's attempting to do in that essay. It was one of those essays that um, are part of a larger genre kind of post nakba kind of reckoning, right? Which uh, tend to be self-flagellating, if you could put it that way, you know? Um, and, and his was very much that as well. The difference is that he uses most of the references from his own literary critical training. So there's long discussions of Othello, for example. Um, but he, uh, part of my point in, in that essay that I wrote is that Edward is not typically thought of as somebody deeply involved in Freudian things. I mean, it, it, when you think about it, long passages of the book beginnings are Freudian. Not psychoanalytic, that's important, but Freudian. And one of his last books on uh, Freud and the non-European is also Freudian. Again, not psychoanalytic, but deeply Freudian. So this notion of the Arab mind, about the, the, this idea that he had that the Arab mind, and he did talk about it just that way, the Arab mind, which sounds kind of like Orientalist, you know. But uh, it is a phrase that would have been found in some of the great writers who preceded him in um, the Nada, the Nada intellectuals, like uh, Constantine Zurek, for example, which found it to be uh, tactically useful to refer to an Arab mind, in spite of the dangers of you know, foreclosing difference, in order to create a sense of unity and solidarity, I would say, even, among the various different Arab realities. There's partly that. But I think he's also talking about a, a particular culture that uh, labors under uh, a language that is so perfect in so many ways and so expressive from Edward's point of view, Arabic. So that's part of what he's interested in, and that is also partly what allows him to talk about such a thing as the Arab mind. Anyway, I'm going on too long. The point is, I would have loved to really look at that and look at it closely. Like I said, the, the first time, the first, the first uh, manuscript that I produced for this biography, which I thought was good to go, you know, um, was much longer than the current one. And I really got into a lot of the, these things. Um, but, yeah, I, I was vetoed. And as I say, I, I bristled and, and thought that, you know, I was being censored. And I really had serious doubts that she, that, that FSG really intended in the end to publish it. I thought it was a, some sort of cruel joke that they were putting me through the hoops only to say, no, we're not publishing it at the end, you know. I, I suspected political double dealing. And it was nothing like that. It was just she knowing that when a book like this, a commercial book about an intellectual goes out into the world, people are going to read it a certain way and they're going to see certain things and they're going to be able to put up with certain things and not other things. So as I say, I learned a lot about not using adjectives, not using adverbs uh, and, and briskly moving along. So um, all of this militates against my training and sensibilities. You know, I'm a, I'm a theorist, a cultural theorist and an academic intellectual. I like to get deeply into things. Uh, and this was a constant sort of get enough across that people understand what's at stake. Uh, and they get the general idea, but, but resist the temptation to get into it. Yes. I have a question about you. your book, which I read in English, and it's an excellent translation in Arabic. Uh, 
And something really surprised me, and I think uh, our president, Ahmad Dalal, will agree with me. The impact of Shah Malik on Edward Said. It looks like they are opposites in every possible way, and yet you emphasize that. There's no question. In what sense he affected him? I mean, you can look his, at uh, his the early philosophy of Shah Malik is so different. Mm -hmm from what Said stands for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a very young man, of course, he, he would stay at his house for long periods of time. Uh, Malik was a friend of the family. He was constantly around in Dur al shwar He was around in Cairo. Uh, he taught at the same, uh, on the same faculties as Edward, both at AUB uh, and at times at Harvard, where uh, Edward went as a visiting professor. They were constantly around one another constantly talking, including at the early part of, his, uh, of Edward's life when he was trying to figure out his own kind of intellectual direction. Malik is a great negative influence on him. This, I don't know, this man who collaborated with the CIA and invited the US military in, the man who is a racist and uh, deeply prejudiced against Muslims and, and all of those things. But he is this fantastic representative of somebody with an academic training, somebody who is a, truly an intellectual who studied under Whitehead in England and under Heidegger in Germany personally. He knew this. He, was a, he read everything. That somebody like this could write for foreign policy but somebody like this could get a position at the UN that was deeply influential, that he could affect, in fact, the, the outcome of the, the writing and publication of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That is something he could only have deeply emulated and did and said he did. This is a negative model, but a model. But it goes, goes deeper than that, that at the very time that Edward is most around him. Because you know when Edward came over to the United States at the age of 14, he needed legal guardians in the United States. One of these were relatives who lived on Long Island, whom he hated, and the other was Malik. Okay? So at the very time that he's in this formative period of his life, and he's off spending this time with Malik, who ushered him around, who considered him a protege, you know. Um, Malik is writing essays that point for point express the themes that Edward would explore for the rest of his career. Almost all of them. So I have no doubt at all about this influence. He even says so, but he does, of course, emphasize that it was a negative influence. I think, you know, the other thing about influence, maybe this doesn't mean much to you, but I, I taught a seminar on Said years ago. Like I said, I, I wrote a lot about Edward, even when he was still alive. Um, but um, I taught this seminar, I wanted to get across to people why he matters, and they did learn a lot, I think, and they did like the class. But the one thing that they said was missing is, I want to know more about where he came from, you know? How did he get to think these things? You know, what were his, what were the influences? And that's one thing that I was really keen to try to do in the book, and I think I do. Um, it isn't only Malik. Uh, I think uh, Sadiq al Azam matters a great deal as another kind of model, right? The enfant terrible, you know, the Arab world, the one who's going to secularize people and and become uh, a willing pariah, you know. There's, there's that kind of influence. But more than that is, and this maybe would only matter to people in the university, how much he learned from Blackmoor and from Levin, particularly Levin. Because believe me, the people who read Edward don't know anything about Harry Levin, and they care less. Okay? Levin opened one door after another for Edward. And he continued to defer to this professor of his, who was one of two of his PhD advise, advisors, 
he deferred to him as, 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 as a, an established intellectual and professor himself. He continually asked him for his advice. Levin is the person who really pushes Edward more towards a humanist universalism, and he's the one who turns Edward on to Erich Auerbach and uh, Spitzer. These are, these are people maybe that wouldn't matter to many of you, but you know, very important emigres from old Europe who are philologists, intellectuals, right? polymaths, who are interested in literary realism versus modernism, for example. You know, Ed Edward's whole um, brief as a professor at Columbia was to teach literary modernism. He was a, a modern British specialist. That means that he was teaching the height of literary modernism. And, and Levin is telling him it's, the action is with realism. Levin writes a book on realism against the stream that Edward continually comes back to, continually touts, says is, is a book at least as good as Erich Auerbach's famous book, Mimesis. So the, the influence of Levin is huge on Edward. I don't think anybody has really appreciated how much. So this would be another kind of counterintuitive example of an influence along with Malik. So I had heard uh, before that Christopher Hitchens and Saeed had a falling out, and I knew only that it was toward the later stages of his life. Uh, but really, anything I've read about it online has seemed anecdotal or hearsay. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the substance of Hitchens' uh, accusations and maybe what their incentives were and what your experiences were like advocating on Dr. Saeed's behalf in that time. I mean, I knew, I knew Hitchens. Uh, you know, I'm not... We weren't friends, but I had many encounters with him over the years. I had a fight with him on the podium uh, when my book on Salman Rushdie came out because he was one of the speakers at the same event, and I knew what he was going to say before he showed up. He's opposed to religious belief in all its forms and thinks that it's only reactionary, and I took a more, from my own point of view, dialectical position towards it. So. I sort of tussled with him, and he was very angry, and he walked out. So I've had, and then there's friends I have at the University of uh, Pittsburgh who knew him really, really well, and he would come there as a visiting professor, and we would, I'd see him a lot. I invited him on two occasions to speak at the universities that I was working at. So I know him personally, I know his encounters. I, I think he's a brilliant writer and extraordinarily uh, clever. Uh, but when he, out of his hatred for Bill Clinton, began to um, conspire with the Kenneth Starr investigation into Clinton's wrongdoing, doing, which is a lead up to the, uh, the bogus impeachment case delivered against Clinton. When he did that and was exposed for having done that, he turned radically and abruptly to the political right. So he very theatrically left the Nation magazine, you know, a kind of left liberal bastion in the United States of long standing. And he began to use that cleverness to insinuate himself into the Washington insider set. He lives in Washington, D.C. That's where his beat was, although British, he, that's where he lived and that's what he would write about. And he was the darling of the American right talk shows. So you ask me, why, what about Edward? I was in the car with Edward when I invited him in 1999 to come to the University of Minnesota to give a, a, a lecture, two lectures actually, including the first lecture he ever gave on, on late style, which later became that wonderful book. And I'm in the car with him and we're talking about this, that, and the other thing. I'm driving him in from the airport and I brought up Hitchens and he wouldn't hear it. He wouldn't hear me say anything negative about him. I said, this guy, this guy is going to jettison you. And he just, Edward never, ever liked people that he knew to talk about, to talk, talk ill about other people. He, the one time he got maddest at me was when I said something about somebody, you know, that was negative. And he just said, he got furious with me. He wouldn't talk to me for weeks. So this is the kind of thing. 
he stuck, stuck by Hitchens until it became clear. And this is my own surmise about what the break finally was about. I mean, from Edward's point of view, the break was when, he, when, when Hitchens started attacking him in print. But my own point of view is that Hitchens decided to do this because Edward was no longer useful to him. I mean, partly because of Edward's introduction, Hitchens wrote a lot for the very premier crossover journal, Grand Street, right, in New York. Uh, ben Sonnenberg uh, was then the editor. And they used to hang out together, all of them, along with uh, Alexander Coburn. They were like a group that hung out constantly. When Sonnenberg got ill with uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, Hitchens cut him dead, you know, because Sonnenberg had to withdraw from the editorship of Grand Street, and so why be friends with him anymore, you know, that kind of thing. When Hitchens wrote this piece that Edward asked me to respond to in the Atlantic Monthly, Edward was on his deathbed, and Hitchens knew it, and yet he went forward with this, I think, very dishonest, very scurrilous piece. So my reading would be that Edward was now kind of sick and it was late career and most of the, you know, acclaim and fanfare of Edward at his height, you know, in the early 90s or whatever, had passed. And so he just could afford to do it. But also he was endearing himself to his new constituency. So that, was, that would be how I read that break. I have a question. Having known Saeed at a personal and intimate level, what do you imagine him saying if he read what you wrote about him? I'm sorry, what was that, the last part? What would you imagine him saying or feeling had he read what you wrote about him? Oh boy, I've thought about that a lot. Like I said, my, my only um, comfort here is that I did write about him uh, when he was alive. He never came to me and said, well, you got this wrong, you got this right, whatever. He just took note of the fact that I had done it, but that he didn't say anything. But, you know, uh, he must have liked some of it because we continued to be friends. I don't know. I don't know. I think he probably would have, uh, without contradicting anything that I said, probably independently have written other things to clarify certain aspects about his relationship to here or there, right? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't anyone? I, I know that, how could another person, a third party ever get me right, you know? And I think he would have felt the same way. Of course. Thank you very much. If you want more of Timothy Brennan, he's going to give a talk in the new campus on the 8th. Uh, during assembly hour in the Department of English and Comparative Literature on literary theory, recent literary theory. So thank you very much.